Tangan kanan naik setinggi telinga. Dari lima berjat. Apakah artinya itu? Negara kita telah merdeka. Suara mengguntur. Mengucapkan salam nasional merdeka. Kita siap sedia mempertahankannya Walau dengan jalan yang bagaimanapun juga Merdeka family we were just all at home the kids uh, my sister-in-law was in the house my the, my two children and who was there uh, I think as I recollect I just got on a car and went to work the 30th of September I was at home with my children the 30th that evening of the, the 30th September I was invited to go with some other embassy people out to a uh, a shadow play being staged in a village outside of Jakarta. And it was a lot of fun. And we were there until, I think it was almost one, one o'clock, one thirty, when we left. On the night of uh, uh, September 30, 1965, I was in Jakarta. In fact, along with a number of other diplomats, I attended a... Uh, a Wayang Kulit performance, um, actually not too far from the home of General Yane, one of the generals who was murdered later that night. On the 30th of September, 1965, six of Indonesia's most senior generals were dragged from their beds and brutally murdered. The events of this night led to the bloody mass destruction of the largest communist party outside China and the Soviet Union. It proved to be a major turning point at the height of the Cold War when the West would help an Indonesian general seize power to become one of the most ruthless dictators of the 20th century. The United States, Britain and Australia had desperately wanted to see the overthrow of this man, Sukarno, the first president of Indonesia. Sikarno's allegiances were too ambiguous for the black and white politics of the Cold War. Half a million of his supporters were to be brutally slaughtered when his balancing act failed. But buried deeper than the hidden bodies is the story of the West's involvement and of the deadly propaganda war that still obscures the truth to this day. popular understanding of what happened came from the reporting of a few Western journalists who were in Indonesia at the time. But it was a difficult story to cover, and what they did report was manipulated, cut, and buried in the back pages. This film tells the tragic story of what many would still prefer remain buried as a forgotten footnote of the Cold War. The man who came to power, General Suharto, established one of the most durable and corrupt family regimes of our time. He and his army have the sinister distinction of murdering more of their own people than any other regime supported by the West.
More than 30 years later, after massive popular revolt, General Soharto finally falls. With General Suharto out of power, some Indonesians now feel bold enough to question the corrupted versions of their history. One untold story is about to be revealed in the mountains of Java as the first mass graves are finally opened. Joyo Santoso is the only member of his family who now feels it is safe enough to talk about his brother who lies buried here. Kakak saya namanya adalah Ibn Santoro MA, Master of Arts. Di sini adalah dibunuh kemudian ditembak, kemudian dimasukkan ke dalam lubang, ya, dua lubang yang ditumpuk satu persatu. Ibnu Santoro was dumped in this hidden grave, along with 22 others branded as communist sympathizers. Another legacy of General Suharto was hundreds of thousands of political prisoners. One of those was Dr. Sumiyasi, who was a pediatrician in the capital, Jakarta. Yeah, I stayed in prison 11 years in 10 places. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Dr. Sumiyasi was arrested without warrant, then detained without trial for allegedly being associated with the Indonesian Communist Party, the PKI. My crime is only that I was member of the HSE, and the HSE, it is the Indonesian uh, Scientist Organization. It's a legal organization, but they think that the HSE was a branch of the uh, PKI because HSE always worked for the people. And the, the army, they are very stupid. They are very stupid, very, very stupid. It is only now, too, that those forced into exile are finally free to return. Like Carmel Budiarjo, an English woman who settled in Indonesia in the 1950s. I returned to Indonesia as part of the victory of the Indonesian people in getting rid of Suharto, because if, as long as Suharto remained in power, I would never have been able to get back. Carmel Budiarjo spent four years as a prisoner of Suharto. My name was still there on the blacklist, even though I have a visa. They were under the impression that they would have to go to the commander of the army to get clearance for me. And then suddenly, everything vanished. All the problems vanished, and they said, oh, you can go in, you can go in, it's all right. Carmel is now a human rights campaigner. <laughs> Her friends hope that her visit will help break the conspiracy of silence about the events of 1965. Who was this leader of Indonesia that the anti-communist West was keen to depose? Sukarno was born in 1901 in Java, the dominant Indonesian island. He grew up under the demeaning rule of Dutch colonialism. Sukarno was an ardent nationalist who led Indonesia's independence movement he became president of the New Republic of Indonesia in 1949. 
belum ada yang menandingi Soekarno sampai sekarang. Dialah yang mengerti nasion Indonesia itu. Karena itu juga Soekarno lah yang tidak jemu-jemunya menganjurkan tentang nation and character building. President Sukarno's ambition was to unite a new nation from a clash of cultures, languages, and the world's main religions. Indonesia is the fourth most populous nation on earth and the world's largest Muslim community. Maka karena itu, ayo maju terus, jebol terus, tanam terus. Sikarno thought he could preserve his own one-man rule by balancing the competing ideologies inside his country. I tolerate all ideologies. The nationalist ideology, the religious ideology, the communist ideology. So far, they are not making trouble or damage to the Indonesian state. Sukarno's balancing act might have succeeded indefinitely if the Cold War hadn't been raging outside Indonesia, where the domino theory held sway. Here is Indochina. If Indochina falls, Thailand is put in almost impossible position. The same is true of Malaya with its rubber and tin. The same is true of Indonesia. If this whole part of Southeast Asia goes under communist domination or communist influence, Japan must inevitably be oriented toward the communist regime. America says welcome in a big way to President Sukarno. Vice President Nixon and State Secretary Dulles are on hand at Washington's National Airport. As leader of the highly strategic Indonesian domino, Sukarno was courted by leaders on both sides of the Cold War. He attempted a policy of neutrality, believing this was the best way for his young nation to gain assistance from East and West. May God give us, America and Indonesia, the best friendship which has ever existed between two nations. Only three months after his address to Congress, he visits China and the Soviet Union. This was interpreted by Washington as going over to the communist enemy. The United States becomes even more alarmed by the success of the Indonesian Communist Party in 1957 elections. Indonesia is now seen as a questionable ally. In the largest covert operation since World War II, President Eisenhower backs rebellions against Javanese rule in the outer islands. Let's face it, uh, the United States made a horrible blunder in 1957-58 in supporting a, um, an in, uh, independence movement within Indonesia. Uh, it was a disaster. We should never have been in it in the first place, and. If we were, we shouldn't have been in it the way we were. American involvement was revealed when a U.S. pilot was shot down. The U.S. quickly withdrew support and the rebellions collapsed. Western intervention had backfired. Having stood up to a superpower, President Sukarno's grip on his country tightens and he becomes emboldened on the international stage. Sukarno uses the United Nations to protest about Western intervention in his region. I hate imperialism. I detest colonialism. And I fear the consequences of their last bitter struggle for life. We are determined that our nations and the world as a whole shall not be the plaything 
of one small corner of the world. Shortly afterwards, Britain moves to form the new state of Malaysia on Indonesia's border. Sukarno is not consulted. Incensed, he launches a military campaign against British forces to crush Malaysia. Britain's top propaganda specialist, Norman Redaway, is sent to Singapore to take charge of Britain's propaganda war. What I remember Norman telling me, his uh, mission was very simple. Do anything you, you can, he was told, to get rid of Sukarno. And he was given a budget. It was a matter of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Sukarno had a well-deserved reputation as a womanizer. The CIA had tried to undermine him in the eyes of his people by producing a pornographic film with a body double wearing a Sukarno mask. At least six assassination attempts were made on his life. Sukarno blamed the CIA for most of these. National Congress of the Indonesian Communist Party opened. By the 1960s, under the leadership of Chairman Aidit, the PKI had become the largest communist party outside China and the Soviet Union, with over three million members. The personal appearance of President Sukarno increases the atmosphere of unity of this gathering. Sukarno himself is a nationalist, not a communist. But he depends on the Communist Party because it can mobilize mass support for his political objectives. In return, Sukarno protected the PKI by banning anti-communist press and by restraining the army, also a potent political force in Indonesia. The chairman of the Communist Party had outlined a new approach of a kind of parliamentary road to power. At the same time, the Indonesian army was fairly unique because it, it operated also like a political party. And in that sense, the Communist Party and the army were in competition with each other all from the village level up to the, to the capital city. The West, as well as many Indonesians, fear the country is in danger of falling into communist hands. Supporting the army is seen as the best hope for the anti-communist cause. With the PKI growing rapidly under Sukarno's protection, the lines are drawn for an inevitable showdown. To the north, by 1965, the United States is escalating the war in Vietnam. In protest, U.S. buildings in Indonesia become a target. There were mass demonstrations, thousands of screaming demonstrators that would uh, throw rocks at our embassy several with flaming rags around them. So we were, in effect, um, public enemy number one at that point. We had replaced the British. Anti-Vietnam War protests are also the order of the day at the University of Wisconsin, where Ibnu Santoro has been studying economics for the past five years. Jadi dia dua tahun selama di USA, dia mendapatkan ijazah MA. Kemudian dia mengambil doktor PhD dengan tambahan tiga tahun lagi. His friends from Wisconsin say he loved JFK, democracy, and the American way of life. But Ibnu's fate was to be sealed by the politics of his day. Tapi karena ada konfrontasi antara Amerika dengan Indonesia pada waktu itu, jadi semua mahasiswa yang di uh, Amerika Indonesia ditarik lagi ke Indonesia semuanya, termasuk kakak saya, berikut dengan keluarganya. 
Returning home to a country being polarized by Cold War politics, Ibnu gets a university job by joining the Indonesian Graduates Association, a group associated with the Communist Party. Tensions were also rising in the countryside where the PKI had been enforcing President Sukarno's land reform program. When the UN backs the formation of Malaysia, Sukarno withdraws Indonesia in protest and declares he'll join an axis with Peking and Hanoi. President Sukarno has now gone too far for the West. For nearly 15 years, he'd balanced both sides of the Cold War. By 1965, Sukarno appeared to be siding decisively with the Communists. The West, with Machiavellian logic, hoped the Indonesian army would step in. If the PKI mounted an unsuccessful coup, it would provide the perfect excuse. Certainly, 1965 was the height of the Cold War. Vietnam was very important for uh, the Americans, and uh, the war wasn't going too well. The, the Marines had landed, but um, they had taken some bad uh, reverses. And so, when it appeared that uh, at the back door, Indonesia was about to uh, go completely into the communist orbit, there was a lot of concern. There was a lot of fear. Then Sukarno appears to collapse at a public reception, raising the stakes even further. There were rumors that uh, his kidney was failing, and of course put the army on high alert. It did raise questions, if he's sick, what will happen if he dies? Who will move, who will take over? The PKI do it by, the, by themselves? Will the army do it? Will God knows who else do it? Rumors circulate that an army council of generals, backed by the CIA, is plotting to overthrow Sukarno. The army was clearly keen if Sukarno became incapacitated, uh, they would seize power. Angon munahang sahananing momo dari wakil bede waradu cicing boros dugas pidan sing kita ane kata tutuk rakyat tadi sing sara lantas tuh On the 30th of September 1965 Indonesia is changed forever this four-hour film is General Suharto's version of the events of that night. It was shown every year on all television stations while he was in power. It portrays junior army officers, supposedly under control of the communist PKI, kidnapping and killing the head of the army and five senior generals. General Suharto puts down the so-called 30th of September movement and heroically saves the nation. It's all over in less than 24 hours. My God, they said, well, they've done it. And then the air attaché came running in and said, there were the, the, the servants in his house said they were shooting out in the back of his house. Some general got hit, they said. Turns out to be Panjaitan, who lived right behind him there. So, well, this was a war, you know, beginnings of a, a very upsetting environment, so, but we didn't know what the heck was going on. The morning of October 1st, when Time magazine called me and said, Don, there's been a tremendous coup. We don't know what's going on, but we know that six of the top Indonesian generals have been killed in this slaughter overnight. And uh, we don't know whether Sukarno is behind it, what's going on, but you're the only person, the only journalist in Hong Kong that has a visa. 
Three days after the murders, the bodies of the dead generals are discovered in a well. President Sukarno has appointed General Suharto to restore security. Suharto personally witnesses the exhumation. Suharto also closes down the civilian press. The army-controlled newspapers run false but graphic stories telling how communist women had tortured and mutilated the generals, gouging out their eyes, cutting off their sexual organs and dancing over their bodies. The Indonesian Communist Party, the PKI, is blamed for the abortive coup. The first big event uh, I covered in Jakarta was the funeral of the six generals. We had heard tales about the way this slaughter had been done, the mutilation of the generals, how they had been tortured and killed. and. Um, we had no way of knowing it. We didn't speak to any eyewitnesses. And so if the army put out with authority that these bodies were mutilated, it became the perception. If the Communist Party was responsible, Western diplomats could not understand why it would mount such an ineffective operation. I would have said it made no sense at that time because the Communists were moving very effectively. They were, they were achieving their objectives by other means. And uh, I would have said, uh, why in the heck should they mount a coup? It was known that the murders were carried out by junior army officers calling themselves the 30th of September movement. But the question of who, if anyone, was pulling the strings behind these officers was much less certain. Nevertheless, the diplomatic cables do reveal the West was keen for Suharto and the army to drive home its advantage in this brutal Cold War struggle. In the three or four weeks following the pooch, Norman Redaway put together a radio program uh, which was um, then sent back into Jakarta and broadcast to Indonesian people in the Indonesian language, of course, purporting to be a, uh, an Indonesian-sourced program. They were putting back the uh, a highly coloured uh, version of the story that Suharto and his men were putting about. The British-made propaganda program called The Voices from the Well was broadcast from a radio station set up next door to Suharto's house. The army set up a new tabloid to spread stories of the bestiality of the PKI. They emphasized that women will sink to utmost depravity under the godless communist influence. I didn't have to take uh, great skills for the army to whip up sentiments against the communists. At the same time, I think the whole party was still left in the lurch because they still were in the, in the mode of the parliamentary road to power. So they were <coughs> essentially defenseless and armed without arms. Exactly the situation I did was worried about. Chairman Aidit, the communist leader, went on the run in central Java, telling people to defy the accusations against them by carrying on as usual. It was advice that would prove fatal for many. PKI members in President Sukarno's cabinet were arrested and other senior leaders secretly executed. Sukarno was rapidly losing his grip on power. He appealed for calm, but was powerless to protect the Communist Party he had courted for so many years. After the 30th, when we heard about the rebels, 
we had very much very many books of the from Leninism, Marxism, and so on. My husband said that we we must burn it. Mobs of students hit the streets in protest against the PKI. The army supplied them with lists of targets to be attacked. The Communist Party headquarters was the first to be destroyed. As time went on, we saw that the anti sukarno factions of students gained in strength and importance, and of course they were manipulated and uh, uh, steered uh, by the army. I often saw army officers talking with or conferring with students, letting them know how far they could go that day. From far, I saw a fire and saw so many people crying, crying, exciting, and so on. And I said to my driver, oh, stop, stop, say, you must, uh, we should drive on. Dr. Sumiyasi was coming home from work when she saw her house in flames. Did you ever go back to your house or was that the last oh, No, 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 not mm, anymore to, to my house. It's already destroyed by the two or three trucks hired by group of Suharto. Dr. Sumiyasi and her husband left their three children with relatives and fled. Carmel Budiarjo lost her job as a translator in the Indonesian Foreign Office almost immediately. As suspected communists, Carmel and her husband were arrested by the military. I was sitting in this small room on the side here and the soldiers came in and they asked for me. But I was arrested in the front room. When we were sitting in this jeep taking us out of town, the fellow who was in charge, he said, uh, you have to blindfold. And that completely destroyed me because uh, I, I just couldn't understand why they were doing this. So I became hysterical then. Uh, and of course, you always had the worst idea of what, what was going to happen. You know, they're going to be taken off and shoot, shot or something like that. She was to spend four years as a political prisoner. In the capital city, even people with the most tenuous links to the PKI are arrested en masse. With the names of party members being given under torture, the net gets wider and wider. Dr. Sumiyasi and her husband are caught on the run. Uh, when Ben Suroso called me for an interrogation, and he is very, very cruel, he said, Are you a member of the PKI? Oh, no. Are you doctor of the, of the CC? I am not a member, how can I be a doctor of that? As the wife of a party member, she was threatened with electric shock torture when she would not cooperate. Oh, my heart beat it so hard, maybe that somebody can hear how hard it was. Then uh, I blew him on his stomach. Hey, Pastor, don't do it, pa. don't do it, please don't do it. What? Why? I am electrophil. What's that? Electrophil. Electrophil. I can die when you give me. Oh, it's very, very low. Although it's low, how low it, it is, I, I, I can die. And when I am dead, my, my uh, spirit will strangle you. 
With his balancing policy in ruins and under pressure from the military, President Sukarno appoints General Suharto as the new head of the army. I, President, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Indonesia, appoint Major General Suharto, I appoint him as uh, Minister, Commander of the Army. Now in official control of the army, General Suharto plans the systematic destruction of the Communist Party. He immediately dispatches his para-commando troops to central Java. Here they purge any army officers sympathetic to the PKI. The army then turns its attention to alleged communist sympathizers all over Indonesia. As long as there is still one communist in Indonesia, I think we are still, or oh, we still have a military operation against this one person. Well, Aswato gave the orders to clean up everything, you know, to every commander who was under his organization. So this is what I did. I ordered all my people to send patrols out and captured everybody in the PKI post. Captured PKI leaders at first stuck to their principles of keep your mouth shut or you don't know anything, can't do anything and don't understand anything. But the operations has found an efficient answer to these slogans by launching the drive of surrender, support the government, or die. The district of Prambunan, known for its thousand-year-old Hindu temple, was one of the first to feel the wrath of Suharto's ideological cleansing campaign. The army swept through Java, looking for communists, stirring people up, and uh, they came upon many peasants, and the soldiers would say, um, you're, you're PKI, you're communist. And the poor peasant farmer would say, what, what do you mean PKI, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? And uh, the interrogation would go on, and the, the farmer might say, um, Oh, you're talking about those guys who came around and offered us uh, seed uh, at, uh, at cheap prices. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. We, yeah, we signed up with them. But they, that, that's not, that doesn't mean I'm PKI. I wasn't a communist. Those are just fellows who helped me out when things were tough. And certainly they did kill communists. They also killed a lot of people who were probably not communists. The army was in complete control. You couldn't get 10 feet out of Jakarta without proper papers and permission from the army. After uh, hearing reports of great slaughter going on, I was finally allowed to drive down there. At that time, there were two or three military trucks filled with uh, civilians, families, uh, men, women, children. And um, we were told these were communist suspects. This wasn't something I was supposed to see. 
But I can recall that day there were something like uh, 2,000 uh, people just in that one day being rounded up and taken to uh, a central uh, holding place. One of the most amazing things was that uh, uh, you had a, a major massive communist movement done in with weaponry and power and force that was contributed by the Soviets, which is, <laughs> there's a tremendous irony in that. And uh, we can't help but take a certain satisfaction in that. In Jog Jakarta, Ibn Santoro's name is given to the army. Jadi itu tepatnya adalah tanggal 10 November tahun 1965, ya. Kakak saya didatangi oleh dua uh, polisi militer, ya. Kemudian dijemput, kemudian dibawa untuk ke kantor polisi militer tadi itu. Terus kemudian pamit dengan istrinya sama anaknya dicium, terus kemudian sudah tenang aja. Saya mau ada urusan sebentar dengan pihak uh, yang berwenang. Ibn Santoro was taken to this interrogation center only a few hundred meters from his house. Here he is detained and tortured. Kalau ditahan di situ kemudian tiap hari dia datang mengantar makanan, minuman, pakaian, juga rokok. Setelah itu, kemudian setelah perang selang berapa bulan, ya, itu kita mau ke sana, sudah dikatakan bahwa uh, Ibnu Santoro sudah tidak ada di situ lagi. Ibnu is taken on a four-hour drive with 22 others. One of Ibnu's fellow prisoners on the truck manages to write a list of everyone's names on the journey that day. He persuades one of the soldiers to draw a map of their final destination, which makes it back to relatives. Ibnu is taken to a forest near the village of Kaliwiro, where a hole has been prepared. Here he is shot in the back of the head. Seven weeks after the murder of the generals, Communist Party chairman Aidit is finally captured in central Java. He's forced to sign a confession and is then executed on General Suharto's personal orders. The once invincible President Sukarno is now powerless to prevent the wholesale slaughter unfolding in his country. General Suharto and the army now plan his downfall and the complete takeover of government. The military arms civilian death squads and supervises further mass killings. This man was part of a Muslim militia gang in East Java in 1965. Sometimes, you know, all the students were, were collected in, in a certain place and then instructed by a certain leader from the army, you know, and they distribute, they distribute to us uh, a number of people, you know, and ask us to, to kill them. So we know exactly that this is organized. The U.S. provided secret financial assistance. I saw many broken bodies and many pieces, torsos, legs, arms, floating in the canals. And uh, this went on day after day, night after night. Hundreds of them.
Although there were several journalists inside Indonesia filing reports, the true story of a one-sided slaughter did not immediately reach the Western public. I reported many interviews of catastrophic uh, occurrences, but uh, a lot of them didn't see the light of day in newspapers. I wrote a daily file for Time magazine, and uh, I also sent reports to the BBC and to NBC News. Most of my, my material was going through other journalists who were staff people in Singapore, and they would edit my stories, discard my stories, because they didn't believe them. It's incredible that they could second guess and uh, uh, kill my stories uh, that I was gathering on the spot. In the mid-1960s, at the height of the Cold War in Southeast Asia, stories that might engender sympathy for communists were not welcome. In this context, most newspapers and broadcasters reported the army's death squads as engaged in a civil war. There really was no sense that there was a centrally organized slaughter of alleged communists. It was being presented um, from all directions as a, a sort of uh, running battle going on between, you know, organized communism and an organized army. It was a cleaning up operation. It was not a slaughter. The word slaughter didn't pass anyone's lips at that time. The scale of it was not understood. On the island of Bali, the army laid the groundwork for communal butchery. Propaganda teams toured the countryside, spreading stories of PKI plans for women to seduce and castrate soldiers to obtain weapons. There was a deadly choice. You either took part in crushing the communists, or you were one of them. I was told by the General Sowa, Eddie, that whereas his boys, uh, as he put it, had, uh, had had to encourage uh, and stimulate the killing in Java, the killing in, in Bali was so intense that they had to stop it, they had to put a stop to it. Di sini banyak sekali orang dipotong. Hmm. Masuk di sumur. Saya sendiri, saya tidak uh, tahu, saya uh, gak sengaja bicara. Uh, ketemu saya orang dipotong, saya begini. Ini kenapa anak saya salah? Saya menangis, saya sama anak saya baru saya nangis. Kenapa nangis? Nanti di, dipotong. Saya tuangkan saya tidak uh, lagi. Uh, kenapa uh, nangis orang dipotong? Ke ketajam potong? Ya boleh saya potong. <tuh> Today, the tourist brochures sell Bali as an exotic paradise. They don't mention that 80,000 people were butchered here in the space of only two weeks. From the West's point of view, the bloodbath had begun as an opportunity to see an end to Sukarno and the communists. Some news organizations outside Indonesia were instruments for broadcasting Western propaganda into Indonesia. Of course, Radio Australia worked closely with the Foreign Affairs Department in Canberra and got advice or guidance, let's put it that way, got guidance from, uh, from the department as to uh, what it should say in its broadcasts. From time to time that guidance wasn't followed, but mostly it's true to say it was followed. The BBC's reputation amongst listeners in Indonesia was high and at a time when the Indonesian people would feel that they could not rely on their own media, they of course are going to be uh, leaning on what they regard as reliable sources, BBC, Radio Australia and so forth. 
I think there's no question whatsoever that we were all manipulated. Um, I think probably the manipulation was being orchestrated by, by Norman Redaway, um, but I've no doubt that he too was also a part of a, an organization um, in which the Indonesians played their part, the Americans certainly played their part. Six months after the murder of the generals, hundreds of thousands of communists and their alleged supporters lay dead. General Suharto's troops surround Sukarno's palace, causing him to flee by helicopter. Later that day, President Sukarno is forced to sign a letter which hands the power of the presidency to General Suharto. Suharto immediately uses the letter to arrest 13 members of President Sukarno's cabinet and to legitimize the slaughter of suspected communists. Jelas dan kita semua tahu bahwa kekacauan dan ketegangan sekarang ini disebabkan karena PKI. Saya menggunakan surat perintah ini untuk membubarkan Partai Komunis Indonesia. Ikiranya SP11 Mart itu satu transfer of sovereignty, of authority. Padahal tidak. Despite President Sukarno's objections, General Suharto had effectively wrested control of the Indonesian state. His takeover was reported as a gentlemanly affair in the London Observer and welcomed in the New York Times, which hailed Suharto as a gleam of light in Asia. I welcomed the Suharto regime, and most of the journalists did. It was the first time order had been seen in Indonesia for about 10 years. The Economist in early to mid-1966 started peddling the US line that Indonesia was safer under a disciplined rule. That certainly was true, it was safer, but to deny the level of destruction and the human tragedy that had taken place seemed to me quite idiotic. The majority, I think, of the press was looking the other way. You know, there was no condemnation of it, I think. It was kind of tolerated and accepted. In fact, a kind of welcoming that Indonesia was joining the fold of the anti-communist movement. The Indonesian domino ultimately fell on the western side of the Cold War divide. Compared with getting bogged down in Vietnam, it was seen as a clear victory for anti-communism and for President Lyndon Johnson. Visiting Vietnam later in 1966, LBJ was to invoke Indonesia as a rallying point. He told US troops that their exploits were the reason why people in Indonesia were enjoying freedom that they didn't previously have. But in reality, it would be more than three decades before Indonesia would taste political freedom and freedom of speech. Now, after General Suharto has fallen, Indonesians can finally question his official version of their history. Like Professor Arif Budianto, the forensic pathologist who in 1965 was called to examine the bodies of the dead generals. I got three bodies to examine. Not a single one of the bodies do we find the penis slice. Or we had signs of torturing them. We don't find. Nobody is glad to sign our reports because the newspaper they wrote already about the torturing. They said the penis is too. They cut it off and then they throw it. They play with that. The Gar Garwani's women. Professor Budianto's autopsy report was suppressed under the orders of General Suharto. Many Western journalists accepted the lurid story without question. Terror and bestiality was a calculated part of the PKI plan. 
They even had special mutilation squads made up of girls. Sex orgies went on before the torture ceremonies got underway. Eventually, the mutilated bodies were dumped down a well. This monument was built at the place where the general's bodies were dumped down the well. This is what pains me most to see the women here because I spent several years together with women who had been tortured to confess that they had perpetrated uh, sexual crimes against the bodies of these generals. And of course we know that that was not true. Their confessions were published in the newspapers. And this was perhaps the most important propaganda weapon that Suharto used to send people out and kill members of our suspects, communist suspects, family, everything. Tapi gurunya bilang ini betul apa yang dilihat sini. Betul. Nah, tapi sebetulnya banyak bohong di sini. Banyak hal yang diuraikan di sini di diorama itu tidak benar. Karena saya dulu juga kenal dengan wanita-wanita yang dikatakan begini, tapi mereka tidak berbuat begini. Jadi ini banyak sekali bohong di sini. Gimana maksudnya bohong? Suharto itu berkuasa. Jadi dia membuat dia membuat ceritanya sendiri apa yang terjadi di sini supaya orang benci sama PKI. Dulu kan suka di itu putar 31 September. Iya. Yeah. Itu Satu filmnya itu benar apa enggak itu? Tidak benar. Ah. Yeah. Banyak bohong. They say here these killings shouldn't be repeated. What happened after this was not six people being killed but more than 600,000 people killed and these are the people I'm thinking of now because I think they deserve a monument for the way in which they were killed. Military courts put more than 1,000 people on trial for the murder of the generals. There were no acquittals. The courts ruled that the Indonesian Communist Party was the sole puppet master behind the murders. Over 70 death sentences were handed down for the crime of having prior knowledge of the plan. But it's far from clear who else had prior knowledge of the plan to kidnap the generals. True responsibility is variously attributed to President Sukarno, General Suharto, and Western intelligence agencies. The only leader of the 30th of September movement left alive is Colonel Latif, who survived 33 years in prison. He claims he informed General Suharto of their plans, and Suharto has admitted meeting with him. Saman Mitu. Sudah tentu sama sedar dong memberitahu kalau paginya akan terdapat para jenda sama pengadu karena semua sepakat harta dianggap loyal sama pengadu. Those who see the hand of Suharto say it was his agents who infiltrated the 30th of September movement to make sure the generals were killed that fateful night. The rebel soldiers maintained it was never their intention to kill the generals. Their intention, they said, was to bring them before President Sukarno to face charges of planning a coup against him. President Sukarno was put under house arrest for his supposed involvement. He died a broken man in 1970. 
But what of the role of Western intelligence agencies? Omar Dani, head of the Air Force, received a death sentence for his foreknowledge. Released after more than 30 years in detention, he clings to a view that many Indonesians like to believe. I think that, that uh, the, the CIA is fully involved. And Suharto is, cannot do that because at that time, I don't think that uh, not one general is, is in, in, has the capacity to, to arrange such an intricate and so complicated uh, operation. As CIA station head at the time, Hugh Tovar denies the CIA had any involvement in the conspiracy. In my time, 64, 5, and 6, the CIA was never told to do any such thing. The CIA was sent out there to collect intelligence and report it to headquarters and to tell us what in the name of heaven is going on in that crazy country. You know, that's the way it was. And uh, if you can't, if they can't, the audience can't take that at face value, there's nothing I can say that's going to convince them. What is fully established is that Britain and the U.S. gave extensive support to the army immediately after the murder of the generals, including providing weapons. The full extent will not be revealed until all the documents have been declassified, which could take many decades. For years, American diplomats strenuously denied providing lists to the Indonesian army until recent declassifications revealed the truth. There were lists going around. Uh, I don't know who compiled them, but the theory was they're the people who are going to uh, be extirpated next. So clearly there was a a method and an organization behind it all. It may never be established how many people died in the massacres. Today, some academics estimate up to a million Indonesians may have been murdered. Sampai sekarang tidak jelas berapa jumlahnya. Tapi terakhir Domo yang menyat Domo tamu, eh dia menyatakannya dua juta. Terus yang memimpin pembantaian Sarwo Edi pernah menyampaikan pada seseorang tiga juta. Tapi jumlah yang jelas. Tidak ada yang tahu sampai sekarang. The newly established Massacre Victims Research Foundation wants to confront history by digging up the skeletons that have lain silent for 35 years. This wasn't Nazi-style industrial-scale killing. It was village-level murder with many thousands of graves spread across the country. Yes, kami mendapat surat dari yayasan itu yang mencari orang-orang hilang tadi itu dan dinyatakan bahwa uh, itu para korban yang telah dieksekusi sebanyak 23 orang itu Kaliwiro ini itu akan di makamnya akan di akan digali kembali. Bulannya 6 1965. This grave is unique because here the dead can be identified. The list of names and the map that was smuggled back to relatives provides the crucial information. Sekarang saat ini ya, setelah kami mengetahui ada kerangka ya yang di kalau diidentifikasi ya. Mas Ibnu itu siapa, Bu? Dr. Andes Ibnu Santoro. 
Tayang karena ada dua gigi yang dicabut ya dan sesuai dengan apa itu eh, berita dari dokter yang bersangkutan ya dokter forensik yang memeriksa bahwa ini adalah kakaknya karena pada waktu itu berumur 34 tahun ya itu di sini adalah dibunuh kemudian ditembak kemudian dimasukkan ke dalam lubang ya dua lubang yang ditumpuk satu persatu tanpa dia apa ditumpuk kayak apa saja itu kayak me, apa kayak menimbun binatang saja itu nah, itu saya merasa saya merasa sakit tapi itu kita sebagai seorang Islam Muslim ya yang beragama ya itu semua kita kembalikan kepada yang Maha Kuasa. For Indonesian Muslims, it's traditional to make an annual visit to the graves of their relatives. These families can now rebury their lost relatives in accordance with their beliefs. But as they will soon find out, even this simple gesture will stir old resentments. An estimated 600,000 political prisoners were held without trial in the early years of Suharto's rule. Carmel Budiarjo recalls sharing a prison cell with Dr. Sumiyasi. What always sticks in my mind about Dr. Sumiyasi was she said, we must not succumb to their bullying. And the way we don't succumb is by staying healthy. We have to survive. The two women haven't seen each other since prison 30 years ago. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sekarang mm -hmm. bisa kembali ke Indonesia. Yeah, kembali Dan lama tidak yeah. boleh. Yeah. A Dutch uh, cameraman oh, came cameraman. to Plantungan, Plantungan. Oh yeah. And you were in the film. Oh yeah, yeah. And Examining yes. the patient. With your ear. With That's right, with yeah. your ear. Yes. The only doctor in Plantungan is herself a political prisoner. I am checking her heart with my bare ear. Actually, I need a stethoscope, but there is no stethoscope. Kita membuat tempat yang sedih ini, neraka ini sebahagia mungkin. Hati tetap pedih. You don't, uh, jangan, jangan lupa. Yeah, don't forget. We have always a talk and a bitter heart in all heart all is bitter but di luarnya ya kelihatannya itu kita ini ya biasa saja biasa saja saja sebab itu apa ya oleh karena kita tidak tahu kapan mau keluarnya berapa lama jadi membuat hidup di sini ini sebaik mungkin In the 11 years she was detained, Dr. Sumiyasi barely saw her three children grow up. Kalau anak tidak tahu, kalau anak saya ngomong bahwa saya bukan anak saya, tahu. Waktu di, di itu di bawa ke pelantungan saya, terus ditawarin musik keburu, anak berapa kot seroret tanpa anak, jadi berangkat sendiri. Nah gitu, jadi tidak pernah ngomong seitunya. She wanted to protect her children from the vilification directed at families of communist suspects. Even today, her children still call her auntie in public because of the institutionalized chain from the Suharto years.
After her arrest, Carmel Budiarjo's teenage children fled to London, where they lobbied for their parents' release. After four years, she was let out of prison and told never to return to Indonesia. Her husband was detained for a further eight years. Carmel established a lobby group to draw attention to the plight of political prisoners. Other critical human rights issues in Indonesia soon took over, like East Timor. I remember reading about what was happening in East Timor. I really wept because we knew what the army was capable of. We had tried, I mean, our particular efforts were obviously devoted to getting the British government to stop selling arms. I mean, for so many years we had pleaded with them and they just wouldn't listen. <laughs> By the 1990s, the Indonesian army had been getting away with murder for 25 years with scant criticism from the West. But on this occasion, the Western media managed to get pictures of one of its massacres in broad daylight. In East Timor, the Indonesian army used their tried and true tactic of recruiting militia gangs, the tactic condoned by the West in 1965. I do see a line there right from the start. We condoned it, let's put it that way. I don't think we should have condoned it uh, entirely as we did. We're obviously, we've given them the impression, uh, particularly the army, that, um, you know, in the long run, they can do what they like. But it was the people of Indonesia themselves who suffered on an even greater scale under General Suharto's military dictatorship. And in Indonesia, the army was fully in control of the political instruments of power through surveillance and uh, uh, domestic intelligence, you know, conducting, you know, dirty tricks, operations, including extra-legal killings, kidnappings, you name it, uh, torture, state death. Today, General Suharto may be out of power, but reburying the bones exhumed from Kaliwiro is a highly sensitive issue. Along with the relatives of other victims, Joyo Santoso has come to transfer his brother's bones into a small coffin for reburial in the family cemetery. The foundation has obtained permission to rebury those bones unclaimed by relatives here in the village of Kaloran. Local Muslims object and blockade the house. The generals then order the people to, you know, to uh, be against the communists by picturing the communists as the uh, culprits of the attempted coup d'état on, uh, you see, the night of September 30 uh, and the consequent uh, times. So people uh, uh, were against uh, communism, but actually it's more misperception. <laughs> With the house blockaded, Joyo and the other relatives try to remove the coffins to safety. Kemudian mereka sempat memancing 
emosi ya dengan jalan penempeleng itunya sopirnya keneknya terus kemudian busri juga semacam di di perabahan dengan kasar ya itu silakan ibu ke tempat pakirawan dulu tua tua petinggal kamu nah setelah itu kemudian yang keluar yang pemimpinnya yang pakai kumis tadi itu teriak-teriak punya memaki-maki lah PKI gini 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 kemudian kanan ayo siapa mau marah marah ya. sambil mengeluarkan pisau pedati yang mau marah saya bunuh cuma kecemburuan kecemburuan ideologis karena kita tahu semua bahwa uh, yang akan dikebumikan ini tulang belulang dari orang-orang yang berdekatan sebagai X ketika bunuh S Joyo and the others managed to rescue their relatives bones for later reburial The mob attacks the house and burns the empty coffins while the police stand by. They later destroy the house completely. In the stories of the shadow plays taken from ancient Hindu texts, injustice is bloodily avenged. Forgiveness is not part of the equation. What chance then for justice or reconciliation in Indonesia? Saya menurut saya rekonsiliasi itu kan lelucon saja. Ini sudah tugas negara harus mendirikan hukum, mendirikan lagi keadilan untuk rakyatnya sendiri. Apa persoalan rekonsiliasi? Apa persoalan maaf ini itu? Yang penting. Hukum didirikan, keadilan didirikan, hak-hak azazi manusia yang didirikan. Itu persoalan yang harus dilakukan oleh negara. We have to be honest to history. If we uh, did a wrong thing, then we have to, to apologize. Having struggled against Suharto's authoritarian regime, President Sukarno's daughter now takes her oath as the new president of Indonesia. Like her father before her, Megawati Sukarno Putri must balance the volatile forces inside her country. The military remains powerful. Her only counterweight is Indonesia's fragile democracy and the shaky rule of law. After 35 years, Ibnu Santoro has been rescued from a mass grave and is being given the dignity of a proper burial. One person among the countless victims of this Cold War massacre is finally laid to rest. But in today's Indonesia, the ghosts are very much alive.